The problem of old age is an age-old problem. It's inevitable, and it's vexing for many people who lament the loss of youth and vigor. But it truly is the story of life, which itself is the story of change and renewal, just like the seasons Solomon talks about. By the time we reach middle age, we notice the first signs. We've been aging all along, but it's only then that we really begin to see the effects. And the first clue is our skin. The accumulated effects of years in the sun give us wrinkles, and that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Since birth, you've been making up to 40,000 skin cells every single minute, and that's just your skin cells. They replace the dead cells you constantly shed, so your skin is never more than a month old. Like I said, change and renewal. But the truth is, we're divinely engineered to die. The process is built right into the cells of our bodies. Every day, cells clone themselves in their billions, and the DNA inside is also copied. As old cells die off, new ones take their place. But the cloning system isn't perfect, so any flaws in the DNA are also replicated, and in a lifetime, we make so many copies of ourselves that even the tiniest errors accumulate over time. It's just like using a photocopier. Copies made from a copy degrade in quality. So in your face, for example, you've totally replaced the bone every two years since you were born. So our 70-year-old face is the 35th copy of our baby face but the imperfections get exaggerated with each copy, which explains a lot when you look at some of us. But that's why our faces look so different as we age. Now, let's take this one step further as we set the scene for Solomon's observations in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. Just as DNA determines the outline of how we develop, it puts a cap on how long we can live, and it works like this. Every time a cell divides, it leaves behind a tiny piece of DNA. After billions of divisions, so much DNA is lost, the cells eventually lose the ability to divide altogether. So death is not instantaneous the way we normally think about it. It's a gradual winding down of tissues and organs over many years. When something finally tips us over the edge, the process accelerates. But even when we die, it takes 24 hours before the last skin cells stop dividing, and an astonishing 37 hours before the brain fires its final impulse. But think about it. We're designed to die, and we have to be prepared spiritually just as our bodies get ready physically. In a powerful poetic poem, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember Him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember Him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble, and before your shoulders stoop, Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants, stop grinding. And before your eyes, the women looking through the windows, see dimly. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Right now, you rise at the first chirping of the birds, but later, all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom, and before you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper and nothing inspires sexual desire. Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, 
where the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your Creator now, while you're still young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well, for then the dust will return to the earth and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Those images, the silver cord, golden bowl, and the water jar, are images of death. In essence, life is fragile like a cord that breaks. Even an expensive golden bowl can be ruined, so it doesn't matter how much money you've got when you die. Life may still be around us, but it's no longer accessible to us, in the way a well does us no good if the pulley we need to lower and raise the bucket doesn't work. And when your body breaks and life seeps away, it's like water escaping from a shattered jar. In other words, death is coming for us, so be ready. Make God the central feature and fixture of your life before it's too late. Because the physical decline Solomon talks about is more than offset by spiritual renewal. Let me remind you again of that core passage from Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. As Solomon says, our bodies will return to the earth, but our spirits will return to God who gave them. And despite what the writer says, the dirt is not our everlasting home, which is why Peter can write, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we've been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So now we live with great expectation and have a priceless inheritance, one kept in heaven for you beyond change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation. With that perspective, what God protects us from is not trouble and hard times, but despair and dejection, helplessness and hopelessness. With the big picture firmly in mind, Peter adds, Be truly glad because there's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show your faith is genuine, and being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. So when your faith remains strong, it will bring you much praise and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. The reward for trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. And that changes everything. Everything, writes Solomon, is completely like smoke and vapor, which is the meaning of the Hebrew word hevel. It's fleeting and puzzling. And then he adds that all the knowledge in the world won't help. Keep this in mind, he says, while referring to himself. The teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. He sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. But be careful, for writing books is endless, and too much study just wears you out. That's the whole story, so here's my final conclusion. Revere God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. And with that, Solomon ends his book and his quest for meaning. Meaning, he concludes, is found in those two sides of the same spiritual coin. 
reverence, and obedience. And just so you know, those two things don't always come in that order. Sometimes people come to know and love God, and that's why they do what's right. Other times, they begin by doing what God wants and then come to know Him because of the power and beauty behind His love. Either way, how we get to God and how fast is not nearly as important as getting there. But ultimately, obedience and reverence have to work together. What's really interesting here is that, for decades, scientists and researchers have been studying the key to meaning and satisfaction in life, and they've come to some core conclusions. According to study after study, what people really want to know is what makes life worth living and how should we live to be happiest. The problem, say the experts, is that the more you actively pursue success, the more elusive it becomes because it keeps the focus on you. A large body of evidence says meaning in life is found in two separate sources, dedication to a cause greater than ourselves and from helping others. And that, of course, is the very definition of the Christian faith. When we get our eyes off ourselves by devotion to God and helping those around us, we don't find meaning. Meaning finds us, and it all begins with that commitment to a higher cause. In John 14, Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him, because he lives with you now and later will be in you. When I am raised to life again, you'll know I am in my Father, that you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Did you notice how Jesus says the world doesn't receive the Holy Spirit or even recognize Him because it's not looking for Him? Ironically, the world is searching for meaning, just as Solomon says. The problem is people are looking in all the wrong places, and that's one of the central takeaways from Ecclesiastes. Here's the upshot. Without God, says Solomon, life is random, unpredictable, fleeting, and puzzling. Without God, life is also fragile, unfair, unjust, and unsatisfying. Without God, meaning cannot be found in wisdom, work, money, pleasure, or power. So we're never satisfied, and then we die. But if there is eternity after death, this world can be seen through a whole new lens, in a whole new light the light of the world, as Jesus called himself. With God, life has a plan, purpose, and deep satisfaction. With God, we find our identity, security, maturity, and stability. With God, we can savor the good things and better endure the bad, knowing this life is only temporary and nothing compared to the sweep of eternity. With God, we must be accountable, leadable, available, and responsible. And with God, we know there will be justice, joy, and all the things we yearn for in this life that seems so heartless and haphazard without any kind of spiritual component. Again, it's all perspective and where we put our focus. As writer, lecturer, and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson said in the 1800s, what lies behind you and what lies in front of you pales in comparison to what lies inside of you. He was referring to our own human capacity. But millennia later, Jesus said the same thing, only he was referring to the Holy Spirit who lives within us to guide and shape us into everything God wants us to be. 
And I am leaving you another gift, Jesus adds in John 14, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you? I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. Time is short because the ruler of this world approaches, but he has no power over me, and I will do what the Father requires of me, so the world will know that I love him. And that too is your mission, your mandate, and your message, and mine. So take this to heart. As Solomon says, time is short, but our spiritual enemies have no power over us. We will do what the Father requires of us, so the world will know that we love Him. Just stay above the hevel and the devil, and remember that life isn't meaningless. It just has less meaning than most people seek because the main event is still to come. So remember to live in Christ with boldness and blessings under the sun and in the power of the Holy Spirit. That spirit, by the way, is represented in scripture by flames. So yes, this life is full of smoke, but where there's smoke, there's fire, holy fire. Be blessed.